The sermon today is entitled, Patrick, a Man of Dreams. Today is March 17th, and uh, in this day, 461 A.D., Patrick, patron saint of Ireland, died. And it's on his death day that we remember him. Real name wasn't uh, Patrick, but uh, Maywin Sukkot. And uh, he, uh, that actually is from the Jewish uh, religion. It's um, the festival of booths is called Sukkot in Hebrew. It's an interesting thing. He was most likely born in today's either Scotland or Wales. Okay. So we haven't forgotten the Scott family here. <laughs> he was captured by Irish raiders as a 16-year-old in Northern Ireland. His life reads like an exciting adventure story. Amazing man. Um, and uh, this, he was working uh, with his, uh, one of his family projects in Northern Britain when he was uh, when he was actually uh, captured by the Irish raiders. Um, they had a kind of weird, along the coastal uh, areas of, of Great Britain, uh, they had trouble with both the uh, Irish raiders and they also had trouble with uh, the Vikings uh, later on. Though they were, they would sometimes do it. They call it, it was kind of like a cash, uh, uh, smash and grab. The, the word berserk actually comes from these raiders that would come along these seacoast towns and just grab anything they could. They'd grab women, uh, young men who were for slaves, they'd just anything they could grab their hands on, it was that they thought would be value. But uh, he was taken across the Irish Sea to by these Irish uh, pirates and sold into slavery there. Uh, he was born, as we said, in uh, Britain around uh, 390 A.D. And it was, a, get this, it was an aristocratic uh, Christian family. Uh, they were very well off. They had a townhouse. They had a country villa. They had plenty of slaves. At uh, 16, Patrick's world was completely changed. When, when that kidnapping happened, uh, he was sent overseas to, to tend a sheep as a slave in the chilly mountainside country of Ireland for seven years. And during, according to folklore, um, the Lord spoke to him in a dream. This is one of two times when God really spoke to him through dreams. There were actually four different instances, but these were the two dramatic ones that changed his life. And in that dream, the Lord told him, said, uh, uh, there's a, a ship re ready for you. He found this, uh, uh, these um, um, Irish, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, these Irish people um, that were kind of like pirates, really. And he told them that uh, the Lord told me, I have a passage with your ship. Well, now if you walked up to a ship or an airplane, the Lord told me I have a, I have a flight today. <laughs> I'm going to be going. Well, they put him off until finally one of the guys actually told him, yeah, you can go with us. But once he got on the boat and got away from the shore, they said, yeah, but you're our slave now. But they only kept him for 90 days, and he was set free in England and so he could go back home to be with his family. And... Um, so he's 23 years old, coming home after being away for seven years. That must, that must have been a lot of prayers by those people. But um, anyway, it's interesting. Um, then, then later on, he had dreams that told him to go back to Ireland and uh, spread the, the gospel. He did as a missionary, spent the rest of his life evangelizing Ireland and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's a commentator, Timothy Joyce, and I'm quoting him now. Patrick, then, is an intensely human person, not a plaster saint, I like that term, to admire from afar. He offers a, uh, us a Christian vision of a life honed out of his own experience and trials, offers us a challenge to live our own Christian life today in a changing and turbulent times, comforts us when uh, we are criticized and ridiculed. He, uh, he gives uh, to us the uh, Celtic vision of the intimate presence of God. God in creation and in church, in the church, and in people and in scripture. He is a model for us, uh, giving an example that we're to follow, live authentically our own Christian lives in our own difficult times. 
Now here he is, 46 years old. Can you imagine this? 46. God says, you're going to start, a, i got a job for you. You think that's bad. You could have been Moses who got commissioned at a, mo- at a burning bush. You know how old he was? He was 80 when God commissioned him at the burning bush and told him to go back and save his people. Well, uh, Patrick was 46, and he spends the rest of his life. He is actually buried there in, in Ireland, amazing man. But during those 29 years in Ireland, uh, he baptized 120,000 people plus. He planted between three and 300 and 700 churches. He converted pirates, pagans, paupers, princes, tribal chieftains. That was his method. Incidentally, he'd go to a certain region in Ireland, and he would look, out the chief, look up the chieftain and lead him to Christ. <laughs> and after that, it was like dominoes, you know. But uh, and he's credited with history with having performed over a thousand miracles. So, wow, a man of dreams. And um, through an anointed dream, if you look at your outlines there, God led him out of this terrifying circumstance as an Irish slave back to his family in England. Uh, His dreams motivate him again to return to Ireland as a priest, missionary, and bishop. Inspires us to live for Christ. Amen. Now, Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6. If you're not sure whether your dreams mean anything, you better think again, because uh, uh, God is correcting um, two guys, uh, two people, uh, Aaron and Miriam, his sister. That these are the brother and sister of Moses, because they've been speaking against Moses, and the Lord calls them outside the camp for correction. Now, you know, when I was a kid, if I got corrected by my dad, my knee would knock one against the other. Nothing compared to what these two were facing. They, they got himself. You know, what he basically said, how dare you? You know, if I have a, if, if there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision or speak to him in a dream. But my son Moses, I speak to him face to face. And so uh, they, they were disciplined. It's kind of funny that Miriam had to take the discipline. I don't know what was going on with uh, Aaron, but they both had to stay outside the camp for uh, seven days until... Uh, God was ready to accept them back. And then there's a passage in Joel. It's also requoted in Acts 2.38. Peter is quoting this. He's quoting uh, the prophet Joel. And it will come to pass that afterwards I will pour out my spirit on your flesh, all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. That must be me because I'm a dreamer of dreams. That's what got me in the ministry. And, And your young men will see visions. Amen. I guess if you're young and it's a vision, if it's a dream, it's it's really a vision. But I don't know. I never thought that much about it. But interesting. Patrick had uh, three names during his lifetime. Maywin Sukkot was born in 387 A.D. in Roman Britain, and it's uh, I, I kind of gave you a little bit of hint there. Maywin Sukkot would be. Um, a pronunciation. I kind of the Hebrew always puts the accent on the last syllable of a name, and I kind of do it that way. Um, now, Patricius uh, would be his uh, Roman uh, Latin name, and Patrick is his Gaelicized uh, name. So we we'll just we'll stick with Patrick. It's easy to remember. But uh, he was led by his dreams tw- uh, twice. In Ireland, where he was held a captive six years, from the 16th to the 22nd birthday, God spoke uh, in a dream to the the young man who found uh, Christ through his hardships. He uh, told him to go south to Dublin, where he found passage on a pirate ship, took him back to Britain, reunited with his family. Then the second time, here he gets back to uh, home, and he decides that God wants him to be in the ministry, so he becomes a priest in England. Uh, has a parish, but is tormented by these dreams about the Irish calling to him. Come back to us, Patrick. You know, interesting. The place where you were held in captivity as a slave, you know, the the hardship would have been unbelievable. So he asked his bishop in England if he could become a missionary to Ireland. Now, he had false testimony delivered against him uh, by a former uh, friend, so, so to speak, 
um, and and for tw uh, for years he was not allowed to, to do fulfill the vision. It held him back. The false testimony, just like Jesus was given false testimony. You know, there's a lot of comparisons in a lot of ways. So he poured himself out in the remaining 29 years of his life evangelizing the island. And uh, incidentally, he had administrative skills because his his uh, uh, ecclesiastical structure was modeled by the entire Western Europe um, for the diocese type uh, approach to uh, managing uh, the various churches in the region. Very, very beautifully done. Now, there's three traits about this man. His character is what we're interested in this morning. Three things we like about him. He, number one, he's a man of prayer. When he is, those, uh, those years uh, as a slave in, in Ireland, uh, he's a man of prayer. He, when he, a, a fellow slave leads him to Christ, and the first thing he noticed, he has to pray. You're going through a hard time? Pray. I mean, this guy, he, he, he said, he, he didn't really try to count them, but he said, some days you pray a hundred times, you know. And not necessarily, <clears throat> I don't, um, I'm not really into repetitive prayers, folks. Uh, I just believe in praying from your heart. And, and a prayer can be simply, oh, God, you know, and that can be a prayer. What's, that, what's going on? But he's, he was continually praying to the Lord. I love that about the man. And, and that, that habit that he started during that time of great tribulation and trial stayed with him his whole life. But uh, I like Psalm 109, verse 4, where Paul says, I'm sorry, David says, that I've given my friendship to people, and in return they accuse me. But, he says, and I like this, I'm a man of prayer. The Hebrew uh, language, actually, it just has two uh, words. It's uh, the Hebrew word for first person singular, I. And the second one is prayer. In other words, he is such a, a man of flowing prayer from his heart, from his lips, that he just becomes a prayer to God, you know. Well, that's a worthy goal. I love that. I'm a man of prayer. And uh, Patrick was that way, too. So um, his fellow slave said is the one who became a close friend and led him to Christ. And um, Patrick, like I say, days and nights, he would pray into the night. David himself said, even in the watch hours of the night, I awakened in my heart, my thoughts are of you, O Lord. I love that. You know, how many times you ever wake up with a panic dream? That's a good time to pray. <laughs> Remember, God's in control. God's in control. I have to watch. I don't know about the rest of you, but I have to watch. What's that, please? That's a way to go to sleep. I love it. I love it. Wow. Amen. That's beautiful. And, and, and he hears these prayers. That's what I think. So, so Patrick's early hardships taught him dependency on God. You know, I love that. And daily communion with God was his highest priority. These are character traits that we can use in our own lives. Uh, the Apostle Paul taught us to pray with rejoicing even, uh, in, even in hard times. First Thessalonians five sixteen and 17. Read this with me, please. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now he taught us, Paul taught us to give up worry and anxiety. And um, Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. Would you just repeat that with me? Do not be anxious about anything. Now reminding you what anxiety is now. It's perceiving a threat when there's no immediate threat. Anxiety. So say, don't be anxious about anything. Is anything too hard for God? Do I need to cower because of my circumstances? Never. Never. Okay. In every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts 
and your minds in Christ Jesus. In the same way, we must pray and trust God to direct our lives. So many times, uh, Lois and I, over these years we've been together, we've just had to turn and just say, it's got to be in God's hands because I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And, and when I do surrender, <clears throat> when I was a kid, before I accepted the Lord into my heart, you ever heard of the tight, the, the white knuckle cl- cl- club? You sit and you grab the pew in front of you and you hold on. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to respond to the altar call. I'm not going to do it. And, and finally, sometimes we're like that with God, too. Even though you had to let go of your life to walk the aisle, right? Well, we need to let go of a lot more stuff than that. I, I find that when I'm a young man, I want to hold on to everything. And as I get older, nothing really seems to matter that much. Oh, you want that? Okay, take it. I mean, I'm serious. It just doesn't mean that much. It's just stuff. <clears throat> the second trait of Patrick that we can admire, along with the fact that he was a man of prayer, um, Patrick was a man of patience. <laughs> and, and, oh my gosh, it's like the guy who's stomping his feet going, God, I need patience and I need it right now. You know? Well, that's not going to happen. Okay. So, uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I used to read that with sarcasm when I was a young man. Joy. Where's the joy here, God? Knowing that testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect. The word perfect always means mature full grown. You grow through trials. You know? That is if you hold on to your tra- your faith. Some people get mad at God. They don't get they don't make it through the trials. You know, too bad. That means we flunked the test in a sense. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking nothing. Now patience is defined. This is a dictionary. The ability to endure hardship or inconvenience without complaint. <laughs> That lets me out of a lot of stuff. You ever wake up and you're just, you're in a gripey mood? I'm like that. Every time I wake up in the morning or if I, if I take a nap for the first hour after I wake up after a, an afternoon nap, I am a bear, you know, and I'm complaining and whining about everything, something. So it took Patrick from his 22nd birthday to his 46th birthday before God commissioned him, released him to do his work. That's his life's work, too. So he earned favor with his superiors at the time. It took a lot of patience on his part to keep petitioning them, and they kept refusing to let him go into Ireland. And finally, during that time, when he was held in a, in a sort of like in suspension, uh, he earned his education and became fluent in several languages. Now, here's my definition of patience. <clears throat> The ability to have your heart broken and healed by the Master's hand and still able to love, forgive, and restore your perpetrators in the future. You understand, I have a very strong definition for forgiveness. And and I know that a lot of us are just content to pray until we're not mad anymore. But if you take it to the highest level of forgiveness, you can forgive you're not mad, and you can restore them so they can hurt you again, if they choose. We hope they won't. Sometimes they will, and sometimes they won't. But you, uh, it, it calls for, um, that's what patience is all about, really. Okay, acquiring patience, the patience of Patrick, that he, it, it requires obedience. In Acts chapter 2, and they, the disciples, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. So patience is doing the right thing consistently. That's another. That's also a definition for righteousness. I tell the, the guys I work with from the halfway house, righteousness is simply doing the right thing and doing it over and over again. As long as I keep doing it over and over again, I'm a righteous man. However, the one day I stop doing it over and over again, then I'm in trouble. Okay, decide not to. Don't do that. So patience comes by doing the right thing. Then uh, obedience and steadfastness also come 
with a promise. And here's the promise, Revelation 21.7. Read this with me, please. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Amen. So, incidentally, I looked up the word son just to be right on this. Uh, the actual Greek word here on son, huios, means uh, little one. There's a lot of times uh, the monastics, uh, they did a lot of interpretations and so forth, uh, translations. They put the uh, translator's bias, uh, and it was a male-dominant culture back then. But it actually, uh, I don't like to put the word son personally if I feel it's, it's just little ones. Little girls, little boys, little ones. Amen. So, anyway, patience of Patrick requires an act of the will. John fifteen fourteen. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. I'm a Christian. Well, what are you doing about forgiveness? Well, I don't like that very much. I don't do very good at that. Well, then you're not a friend. You can call yourself whatever you want, but you're not his friend. You're for my friends if you do it. You know, it's really important. Okay, so patience is dealing, is developed through facing and dealing with trials. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations knowing that, now read this part with me, please. Tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. I'll finish. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God, agape, has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's Romans 5, 3 to 5. So, he, Patrick was a man of prayer. And secondly, he was a man of patience. And thirdly, he was a man that we can admire because he was a man of perseverance. Uh, in Philippians 3, that's why he got so much done in his lifetime. Brethren, says Paul, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth to those things which are ahead. Read this with me, please. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, Patrick applied for that missionary position to go to Ireland. Consistently refused because of the false accusations I mentioned to you. And finally, when he was 46, officials realized that they were wrong, and they let him go. And, and uh, when falsely accused, Jesus said, you and I are in pretty good company. Blessed are you, remember, when they revile and persecute you and say, all manner of evil falsely against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice. Now, this is a hard thing. You ever struggle with something that Jesus told you to do? Oh, thank you, God. I'm going through this horrible time. You know, I can't do that very well. You know, I have to be careful of my sarcasm when I read this stuff sometimes. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for the, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And that's Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Don't remember that without injustice. Hello? There would be no Abraham who heard the call to leave his home. Why was he told to leave? Because Abraham and the Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldees, they were polytheistic. And, and Abraham had the notion it was one God. And so God, Ab God told Abraham with his monotheism, leave. Okay. And, and, and without injustice, there would be no prophet Moses standing before Pharaoh. You remember injustice with him. His life was full of it. He had to spend 40 years in the wilderness. You know, a terrible thing. And then um, there would be no Joshua without the battles in Canaan. Here's the promised land. Oh, yeah, by the way, you're going to have to fight your way into it. By the way, you're going to have to take it city by city. By the way. But, but Lord, we're not uh, anything but farmers and, and we, we, we're growers and agricultural people. She says, well... It's time that you've heard of beating your, your, what is it, your spears into plowshares? Well, they had to do the reverse. They had to literally confiscate every weapon they could and use it in their, in their battles. Amazing. Injustice. And, and without injustice, there would be no David without a Goliath and his flights from Saul. You know, God already told through, through 
uh, the prophet Samuel that, that David was going to be the next king of Israel, but how many years did he have to wait until that was fulfilled? Astounding. And justice. And there would be no Daniel without the lions. Amen. And there would be no apostles without persecutions. The more that the early church was persecuted, what happened? The more they scattered. And the more they scattered, the gospel went forth. Thank God it came into the western world and not the eastern. We can be glad for that. And remember this, there would be no Jesus without the cross. It was the cross an injustice, the greatest travesty of injustice ever perpetrated by mankind. That's the cross of Jesus Christ. And never forget Patrick's spiritual vow to persevere. Christ in me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ to my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouths of everyone who speaks to me, Christ in the eye of everyone who sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I love that. And incidentally, I put, I put his a total, they, they call it the breastplate. I, I reproduced that for you. Um, it, kind of pin it up by your refrigerator, remind it every once in a while. He, this man believed in the presence of Christ in your life. And, and he believed it was something that you, it, of course, you, you, you can't take it for granted. You have to lean into him. And that was, that was Patrick. He leaned into the Lord. And the Lord gave him this wonderful breastplate that he talks about here. Lord, we're grateful for the time to share together. Thank you for Patrick. I never get tired of extolling the example of this man for the body of Christ. Father, I pray that uh, this message will help us, encourage our hearts. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Would you please read the old Irish blessing I have there for you? May your day be blessed. May your road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. May the rain fall softly upon all that you plant until we meet again. May God cradle you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless us, everyone. We got a communion service. Lord, we pray that uh, before we leave, as we come up before your table, that we'll allow your Holy Spirit to examine our hearts about any unbelief, any um, any sin that has separated us from you, because we're ready to confess confess that to you in our heart of hearts right now. Father, we want you to remove that sin from us. We pray in Jesus' name. As far as the east is from the west, north is from the south, and set us free. Father, we pray your blessing on the bread as we think about the broken body of Jesus and the wine as we consider uh, his spilled blood for our sins as an atonement. Father, we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Ray, would you come? And Elder Bob, would you come? If you'll hold the elements of communion, we'll share them together. The body of Jesus Christ, broken for you. The blood of Jesus, shed for your sins. The body of Jesus Christ, broken for you. God's final sacrifice, an end of animal sacrifice, by the blood of his own son, shed for your sins. Lord, bless your people. 
Keep them healthy. Keep them with their eyes on you. Bless them in all that they do. Father, give them peace, traveling mercies, your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.